Hey, hi, hello. Nate Stewart here, AMEV. I'm Applications Development Engineer, Performance EV Applications Development Engineer here at AAM. And this is our test tank. So what's a test thing you might ask? A test thing started life as a 2007 Mustang, Ford Mustang GT. And this particular car has been swapped with a Tesla large drive unit. So Testang is a fun play in the word. We got Tesla, we got Mustang. Now we've got a Testang. As you are probably familiar by now, we have developed our own inverter control board for the Tesla large drive unit. With that, we needed a test vehicle. I was on Craigslist looking for Tesla parts and I happened upon this awesome car that was already built, already driving, already had Tesla drivetrain in it. So the car was originally built by an EV hobbyist right in his garage. Really well-built car, great starting point for AAM, saved us ton of time and energy and resources and having to build our own car when we could just buy one that's already ready to go. In our development path, we started with the base unit first. So car showed up with a sport unit. We had to take the sport unit out. We put in a base unit with our inverter control board inside of it. Then the next step, obviously, to kind of round out the system or even get the whole integration started was the installation of the AMEV VCU 200. So the VCU 200 is the mastermind behind the whole vehicle operation driving, contactor control, charging, BMS management, battery management, thermal management, running of pumps, of uh, fans, things of like that. Even does some cabin air conditioning, so heating and cooling aspects of it as well. The VCU had to go in in order to uh, take all the driver inputs, uh, pedal for torque requests, brake switch for safety, as well as our CAN keypad for our park reverse neutral drive, as well as some other optional buttons. So those inputs go into the VCU. VCU gets set up and tuned by the end user. And then through the magic of torque mapping, uh, we're able to go through and provide torque request commands to the drive unit uh, over CAN. So you might be wondering, uh, how is the AEM solution uh, with our own controller board better than other options for controlling a Tesla drive unit? You have your OEM spoofer controls, you have your open source controls. The third solution, the better solution, I think the best solution, is the AEM control board. So with the AEM control board, what we sought to do was create a solution that would give the end user a really well-tuned, high-performance drive unit and picking up off of whatever power that Tesla may have left on the table initially and putting that into the package and making it so that it's safe, that you don't really have the requirement of having to go in and actually change settings or adjustments or try to have to tune the inverter yourself that you're benefiting from all the engineering time that we put into it and have a nice, perfectly tuned package that makes more power than a stock Tesla can make and gives you the ability to do fun things with the VCU, namely torque mapping. So if you've got the original Tesla set up, you're limited to what Tesla gives you based on your throttle input on the accelerator pedal. So if they've mapped it in a way that you can only get so much torque at a certain pedal position, if that torque happens to sweep away for whatever reason, you're limited to that capability, that input. So with a Tesla, you don't have any real tuning opportunity. You have whatever they give you, which is okay. What's better than that though, is having the ability to really dial in a torque map. So on this particular car, uh, this car weighs 3,600 pounds with 450 newton meters of torque motivating it, over 300 kilowatts of horsepower, we actually really needed to go through and fine tune the torque delivery. And the VCU gives you the ability to do that. Uh, you can tune the base torque delivery. You can say that any pedal position give me a certain amount of torque. Obviously you wanna maximize the torque delivery, but within constraint. So while torque mapping is obviously a very important aspect of the VCU, many other aspects of it that you have full control over that these other types of systems or types of integration don't offer. Uh, we can actually uh, tune and manipulate the regenerative torque, which is our braking torque. If you have the OEM control or the OEM Tesla setup, again, you're limited to whatever it is that they give you. If you've driven in a Tesla, you might find that the regenerative braking is actually quite aggressive. It might serve a purpose of trying to put as much power back into the batteries, but may not necessarily be well suited for good vehicle control or stability or performance. All of that is tunable in the VCU. So your motoring torque, your regenerative torque, 
all of that is all controlled by your pedal. Uh, whether you're going into the pedal or out of the pedal, accelerating, decelerating, the pedal map and the pedal feel, how the throttle responds to your input is actually also fully tunable. There's four different pedal maps and you can make it be wildly aggressive or you can make it uh, as calm as something your grandma like, might like driving. With the VCU, when you pair it with our CD dash, there's literally hundreds of channels that get transmitted out from the VCU, everything from motor performance aspects, uh, all the information from the drive unit, the inverter, um, all the other aspects uh, and the current statuses of all the other systems on the car, uh, the battery management. I mean, it's spitting out just tons and tons of data. It's also nice as a CD dash uh, also offers data logging. If you're more a performance oriented vehicle, if you're racing, uh, if you're a sportsman type racer, maybe you're autocrossing, you have all the ability to also not only visualize and monitor live this data, you can also capture it, log it, and review it for post-processing for vehicle adjustments, tuning adjustments, and driving adjustments. So speaking of the dash, speaking of the keypad, let's, let's hop in the car and take a look at some of this stuff. It's what the inside of your typical uh, 07 Mustang GT looks like, except we've added some uh, additional features here. Obviously, first thing is our CD5 dash. So on this page, the first page of the dash display, we've got some pack status channels, some energy channels, also got a speedometer, a power and kilowatt indicator, both for motoring and generating, as well as a range estimate. If uh, we have logging on, you get a little logging active status and in any inverter faults. Page two, this is kind of our tech summary page. We've got information about the battery. We've got information about the drive unit, current torque command, any torque limits, a lot of BMS data, min and max voltages, as well as some temperatures coming out of the drive unit. So these are the 96 different cell voltages as reported by the BMS. We look at this page uh, frequently when we're charging, so we can monitor the charge current coming into the car from the charger, monitor its voltage, and uh, there's also a timer the timer will count down and let us know uh, approximately how much time is left before the battery is fully charged. If you set up your system, your VCU, and your other components in a similar way that this car is put together, all of this will actually just be plug and play. Uh, this will come set up with a file that's already configured for the different CAN inputs. It's just a matter of plugging them all in and this data will just show right up on the dash, no problem. So over here, we've got our CAN keypad. We can hit the ignition switch and then uh, put the car and drive or reverse, whatever the case may be. When you first push it, VCU will go through the contactor activation process. And while that's happening, the indicator will be amber, uh, showing that it's in process. Then if it successfully finishes, the indicator will turn green if for some reason there was a failure and one of the contactors didn't close, the status indicator would actually turn red, letting you know that there is a fault or a problem. Another cool feature of the CAN keypad is actually there's a selectable uh, performance level button, uh, this little turtle and hair button here. So on the fly, we can actually toggle through different performance levels that the VCU and large drive unit can give you. So you can set it up from being pretty, pretty wild and hairy to being pretty calm with just a couple of uh, button pushes. The VCU integration is not just a matter of controlling the drive unit. There's a lot of additional aspects to it, including the data visualization, driver command input. So a lot of these things that help you be in main total control of what you're doing with your electric vehicle. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is our BMS. So let's take a look under the hood and see what we got under there. Here we are looking under the hood. Lots of stuff under here, but the most important thing is the AEM EV VCU 200. Here's the VCU 200, tucked away nicely, went right into this little corner, super clean. This is the main central command brains authority of this entire car. Everything EV is run through this. A lot of stuff going on in a little package. A lot of that stuff being the full vehicle control. If you're using a CAN spoofer solution or if you're using an open source solution, those things work acceptably for running the drive unit, but what about the rest of the vehicle? We can do a more thorough and more complete integration of an electrified e-propulsion vehicle with our VCU because we can look at other systems such as battery management system. We can do thermal management. So it's great that you're able to drive the motor with these other systems, but if the battery is, let's say, being over discharged or critically low on state of charge, if you don't have that information, then you could potentially damage your battery. 
what the VCU does, the beauty of it, is that it's taking all these things and putting it under one umbrella. And if anything has a problem, you can be notified on the dash or you can actually implement your own safety control. If you find that the drive unit for whatever reason is overly uh, discharging the battery or we've got too high of a discharge current level, we can actually limit the torque command in order to reduce current discharge. Same thing with, with generating. If we're in a region and the battery cell voltages are already topped off, we can't put any more voltage into them, any more current into them. So we can actually create a generating torque limit as well in order to reduce the motor's uh, generating current. Everything in the VCU operates over a CAN bus network. The VCU 200 has four different CAN bus networks and we've got things like obviously the inverter drive unit on one of them. This car has our AEM PDU-8 PDU units that are triggering high sides that turns things on and off. Integrated with our BMS-18 battery management system controlling the charger, integrated with the DC to DC, all aspects of the vehicle, not just the motoring driving aspects are being controlled by the VCU. The big picture here, the, the thing to really take away from this is that the whole car, the VCU, is sort of like an ecosystem. So the VCU is the brain, the PDU, the BMS, that's the arms, that's the legs, those are the appendages that are allowing the VCU to do the things it needs to do. VCU is in charge of all those things, even the nitty gritty details like powering a high side output from the PDU or the cell balancing on the BMS. So we're gonna talk about the PDU-8, which is actually available now for purchase. So the PDU is a power distribution unit. Um, it's taking battery 12 volt voltage current supply in and then providing eight separate channels of high side or 12 volt power out. It supports a total of 120 amps and that's across eight channels. So there's four channels that are rated at 20 amps and there's four channels that are rated at 10 amps. And those channels can actually be paired together so you can get up to 40 amps of support or up to 20 amps if you pair two tens. And the testing, uh, we have two PDUs in the car. There's one up here and one in the back. Up here, what it's managing are a couple things. First, we're actually providing most of the peripheral power, things for uh, power for the dash, power for the keypad, are coming from the PDU. That's one thing we're doing. Another thing we're powering is the coolant pump. Okay, we turn the coolant pump on and off when we're charging. Uh, also, obviously, anytime the vehicle's being driven. We're powering our DC to DC. Uh, we've got a General Motors Chevy Volt DC to DC. It needs to be turned on. The PDU is handling that. We also have a Ford Volvo Mazda um, electric hydraulic uh, power steering unit and the PDU is also turning it on and off. The PDU is also turning on the stock Ford Mustang cooling fan as needed based on uh, drive unit temperature. The takeaway from the PDU is that you're replacing a whole slew of relays and switches and you've got this cool small little module that has replaced all the little clickety clackety relays with solid state drivers high side out, instead of having discrete switches to turn things on, it's all being managed through the VCU. The fact that it's small means you can kind of put it where you need to put it. It's not big, doesn't take up a lot of space. We needed one up here, so there's one up here. We needed one in the back, so there's one in the back. So real briefly, what is a battery management system and plainly, why do you need one? We'll just keep it fairly simple. So there's six of them. Uh, there's a master unit and then five satellite units. The whole system communicates over CAN bus with the VCU monitors up to 18 times six cell voltages. So that's 108 possible cell voltages you can monitor. All that's being reported back to the VCU. There's temperature sensors inside each module that are also being monitored and transmitted back to the VCU. So we can do all kinds of things based on the battery state of charge, the cell voltages, both high and low, the module temperatures. Batteries don't like to discharge as much when they're colder. So we can do things like limit the discharge current rate when the battery is cold, all kinds of different things. So as far as thermal management goes, the VCU can support three different types of thermal configurations. One, is if your drive system is liquid cooled only. So in this particular car, the ESS or the energy storage system is all air cooled, no active cooling. The only thing that actually has liquid cooling is the drive unit. Configuration two is uh, if you were to put the drive unit and the energy storage system components, the battery, the DC to DC and the charger on the same cooling loop. So that would be one radiator, one coolant pump, one radiator fan and everything in the car is being cooled in a single loop. Last configuration is actually a dual loop, dual independent cooling loops for both the drive system 
and for the ESS, the energy storage system. Sometimes the drive unit and the batteries and such operate at very different temperatures. So you don't want to combine those sometimes into the same cooling loop and you actually want to separate them so that the drive unit, which typically gets a lot hotter than the batteries, can be cooled separately from the batteries that like to stay within a certain range of temperatures. So the VCU can support basically the whole gamut of possible thermal management configurations you can possibly think of. You might be wondering, what does it take mechanically, physically to put a Tesla large drive unit into a car, specifically into this Mustang GT. So obviously first, the original drivetrain is all removed. Uh, the original live rear axle, the drive shaft, the transmission, the motor, all gone. To make room for everything else back here, uh, this is where the stock fuel tank used to live. So the stock fuel tank, all the emissions equipment, all that stuff, all gone. The car has got a box right here and inside that box are the contactors. All right, so those are the relays or the switches that connect the battery high voltage plus and minus to the inverter. So the spare well uh, has been cut away. The unibody frames have been trimmed a little bit and some pads have been fabricated into the car that the subframe bolts right into. So these are the original mounting points that would have been on a Model S and there've been some pretty heavy wall steel plate and square tubing has been welded to the chassis of the car. It's just four bolts and the drive, the whole drivetrain uh, subframe just drops in and out of the car. We've got it down and we can get it out in about 10, 15 minutes. It's really fast. All right, so we've got the contactors in the back, the drive unit. Uh, these are the stock lower links for the suspension on the drivetrain, the subframe here. Some aftermarket links have been added in, mostly just for uh, alignment adjustment, uh, the camber and the toe and such. The Model S, I'm pretty sure, has a fairly complex like air suspension. Uh, that's been removed and some traditional coilovers, some QA1 coilovers have been put in the car. To get everything kind of packaged together, some very specific offset wheels had to be found. And these particular wheels are actually off of a 2008 Chevy Corvette. The rears are 19s, the fronts are 18s. They've got just the right offset just the right width, they fit in really nice. So as you saw when we were looking at the car from above, when we were under the hood, uh, there were six battery modules at the front, three across the top and three underneath. There's six more battery modules distributed throughout the car. So we've got two here where the gas tank used to go, we've got two more here where the transmission used to go, and then we've got two more up here kind of where the bottom of the engine would be. So all those are stitched together in series, they're paralleled up with the other group of six on top, and then all that power gets transmitted back here to the contactors in the contactor box. So the drive unit is liquid cooled. There's hoses that come in and out. Uh, the liquid cooling goes into the motor, through the motor, into the inverter, out of the inverter, and then we run these lines. We've got these hard lines that run the full length of the car that come forward into the radiator. The radiator is the stock Mustang GT radiator. Great setup, big, lots of cooling. Comes out of the radiator, into the pump, out of the pump, through the lines, back to the motor. So uh, this is actually a Tesla Model S cooling pump. Works great, might as well reuse it. Put that on the car, uh, draws a lot of current, moves a lot of coolant, so it's a good pump. That's our cooling loop, pretty simple. So now they're back at the front, we know that we've got lots of go with all that Tesla power. We also needed some additional woe, which we've got in the form of some Willwood big brake kit here. Uh, so those are 14 inch disc, six pot calipers, definitely no shortage of braking power. And a big thanks to Willwood for uh, outfitting the car with some killer brakes. All right, so up here in the corner, uh, this is actually our vacuum assist power brake pump. So that's a little vacuum pump and reservoir. So we've got that hidden behind the bumper. So that's what we, so we can still have the uh, standard vacuum assist power brakes with the power brake booster that comes on the car stock. So we've pretty well covered a lot of stuff in the car. We checked out everything above, we checked out everything underneath, talked about the different subsystems, the components, how the VCU all goes together. And the real important thing that we all wanna know is what kind of power does this package actually make? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take it off the lift Roll it over to AEM's dyno, strap it down, and let's see what kind of numbers it actually does. <laughs>